This is a Chefs Without Restaurants mini episode with Jensen Cummings on what it means to be a chef. And when I see things playing out like labor shortages, we don't have a labor issue. We have a culture issue playing out at mass scale. Restaurants are not a great place to work. And we're being called out on that. And we don't like it. And I understand because I am responsible for helping build the dynamic that is at play. The state of this industry is not the fault of a 22-year-old quote-unquote kids these days. They're the best chance we have to succeed if we listen and lead with some empathy, something I forgot a long time ago and I'm fighting desperately to find again. Kids these days are saying they don't want the cubicle, the nine to five, the suit and tie, except they're saying we don't want the overworked, underappreciated, undervalued that is this industry. I'm not going to work for, for, for poverty wages in abusive environments to maybe someday be able to be what? The chef owner of a restaurant that has a 4% profit margin? This is the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast with your host, Chris Spear. Each week, I'll be speaking with food entrepreneurs and people in the culinary industry. If you're interested in learning more about our organization dedicated to helping people build and grow their food businesses, look us up on the web at chefswithoutrestaurants.com and .org, and on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Chefs Without Restaurants. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast. I'm your host, Chris Spear. On the show, I have conversations with culinary entrepreneurs and people in the food and beverage industry who took a different route. They're caterers, research chefs, personal chefs, cookbook authors, food truckers, farmers, cottage bakers, and all sorts of culinary renegades. I myself fall into the personal chef category as I started my own personal chef business, Perfect Little Bites, 11 years ago. And while I started working in kitchens in the early 90s, I've literally never worked in a restaurant. Welcome, everyone. We are back with another one of our mini episodes on what it means to be a chef. Although this one isn't so much a mini episode, and it isn't necessarily just about what it means to be a chef. As many of you know, I have been going back to some of my favorite guests in the past and asking them this question since I didn't get to ask them it when they were on the show. So today, I have Chef Jensen Cummings. I recorded a full episode with him back in August of 2020, and I reached out to Jensen because I wanted to ask him the question I've been asking a lot of my guests this season, which is, what does it mean to be a chef? Now, I had a feeling that Jensen was not just going to come in and drop a little three-minute tidbit here. This episode runs about 16 minutes, and it's not just about what it means to be a chef. Jensen's going to start out talking about his background a little bit in food service. He's done probably literally everything in food service from washing dishes to executive chef, podcast host, you name it. So I wanted to let him set up the episode a little bit so you'd have some context about where he's coming from. Jensen actually really takes this as an opportunity to kind of talk about the state of the restaurant industry, not just what it means to be a chef. I don't think it's any surprise that people talk about how toxic the restaurant industry can be how problematic some of these things are. And Jensen says, yes, I was part of that system. I own it. I am part of the problem. But he's realized that. And I think he's one of the most inspiring voices in culinary right now, which is why I want to have him on the show. If you don't know much about Jensen, uh, you'll get the whole rundown in this episode. And you can also listen to my full one-hour podcast episode with him. I'll link all that up in the show notes. And as always, if you love the show, I would love for you to share it with everyone. Let people know the show is out there. It's on all podcast platforms. Maybe share the link to this episode. I really think it's important. Not just for chefs without restaurants, but especially chefs with restaurants and working in restaurants. And if you want to go the extra mile, drop a rating and review. You can rate and review on iTunes, Spotify, or directly on our pod page website. Thanks so much for listening and have a great week. Chef, the French word for boss, assigned to those who run a professional kitchen. 
It's a simple enough term. Turns out, not so much, at least for me. My name is Jensen Cummings. I've got uh, 22 years in the industry. I want to take just a couple minutes to tell you about some of my personal journey, some of the uh, joys and pains of that word chef, and give you also some insights into what chefs are going to be held accountable for, responsible for, opportunities and challenges that they'll face uh, in the future of our industry. Like many of you, I've run the gamut from dishwasher, line cook, sous chef, executive sous chef, chef to cuisine, executive chef, chef owner. I've even taken stints as bartender, general manager, uh, back to wishing I was a dishwasher, consultant, uh, owner of CPG companies, consulting firms, uh, event production, just really touched every area, had a nonprofit working on uh, culinary events. So, you know, many hats like a lot of you, I'm sure, understand and have gone through as well. And now with Best Served Creative, we're really focusing on unlocking the stories and potential of chefs, among others in our industry, through media, messaging, and marketing. We have to tell meaningful stories. We get so chummed up in the minutia of what we do and how we do it, we forget why we do it and who we're doing it for. And so the idea is to really amplify the worth and work of those who feed their community through media, messaging, marketing, being able to get those stories out there. Because the food, and this is hard for me to say as a chef, the food is just the proof that you are who you say you are. We need to really understand that and get to that. All right. A little on the, uh, on the background side, kind of where that started as a dishwasher. Uh, that story actually, though, starts long before... I was even around. I am the fifth consecutive generation in my family to be in this industry. My great great grandparents opened up a restaurant called La Fond House in Little Falls, Minnesota. And even Fond, you all know Fond, the uh, the French sauce of deglazing pan drippings. So we even have some Parisian family that was also in the industry. But that set us on this trajectory in the United States, so 122 years. We are gluttons for punishment, to say the least. Uh, and then great-grandparents had restaurants, bars in San Francisco. Grandfather, also a barman in San Francisco. And then I have three uncles, my father's three younger brothers, all own restaurants. And even my younger brother, also in the industry, we cook together for quite a few years as well. So there's a lot of family legacy, which, you know, I was never told when are you going to get a real job in big air quotes, like a lot of us in the industry have been. Uh, so there was a lot of opportunity and empowerment that I felt also a lot of a lot of burden and weight of that legacy as well. And I'm sure that'll come up a little bit more as I speak with you throughout this. But then for me, professionally, it started at 17. And I was a I was a fucking punk kid. You know, doing all the stupid shit, selling drugs, doing drugs, getting into trouble, uh, just, you know, skater punk from Southern California, didn't quite fit in. You know, I used to think I was smarter than the cool kids and cooler than the smart kids. Turned out I was dumber than the smart kids and not as cool as the cool kids and uh, always kind of felt that. And at 17 years old, when I graduated high school, my uncle said, come out to Ames, Iowa where my two uncles had kind of built a little a little empire, mini empire, five, six restaurants at the time in Ames, Iowa, where Iowa State is. Come out here for the summer, get out of California, you know, chase some college girls and, and wash dishes at my restaurant. And I went and <laughs> lived in his garage for a couple months until, like so many of us know, I bunked up with uh, people that I worked with and got myself into more trouble. But that, even the first day in the kitchen, the intensity of it, the controlled chaos of it, the 
the dance, the the beauty of all of what, you know, I don't need to tell you if you're listening to this, you are somebody who understands that deeply, both the joy and pain of it. Stack of dishes as tall as I am, 6'2". That's a serious stack of dishes to work through. And I just, I felt at home. Like I found my people very, very quickly. And that's intoxicating. And it sucks you in. And there's a lot of Again, a lot of opportunity and challenges that that creates. And, and I think a lot of you know, and I can spend a lot of time talking about the the toxic culture therein because there's a lot of it. Uh, but I felt the camaraderie, which there's also a lot of right away. And, uh, and it put me on a path that at 17, I knew that term chef again. I wanted that. I wanted to be at that top level, I wanted to be somebody because I'm competitive. I wanted to to run shit. I wanted to be able to be creative and innovative and uh, be in charge. So run a team. That was important to me. And I know, again, a lot of you understand what that's like. So fast forward, for me, I really got on that kind of culinary school path. I got onto the chef-driven type path opened up multiple restaurants with uh, my uncles there in Ames and then decided I wanted to be kind of on that James Beard, you know, recognizable chef name kind of trajectory and moved to Kansas City and worked for uh, Debbie Gold, who's a James Beard Award winner, uh, master chef competitor, just great, great mentor at 40 Sardines there in Kansas City. And uh, learned a lot about what it meant to be kind of at that high-end, progressive, fine dining, that level. And again, there was this level of intoxication where like whatever it took to be that chef, I was going to do it. Fuck my health, uh, who I had to, to work with and uplift or who I had to stomp on, honestly, to be able to get to that point. And again, something that's... We just, you get chummed up in the minutia of what you do and how you do it. And so I felt that. I felt that intensely. And that, uh, you know, got me to a point where at 24, moved to, uh, moved to Denver, uh, executive chef at 24, way too young and dumb. But I was ambitious. I was hungry. I was talented enough and worked hard enough to be able to get to that point. That started a six-year trajectory where I started getting noticed, started getting accolades, started getting invited to competitions, winning little awards, getting on TV, radio, in articles. And I think of that quote from, uh, from Christopher Nolan from Batman, where you either die the hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. And as I reflect back, I notice these moments where I just... I just held on too tight. And as a leader, what I know now, but I knew then I just couldn't see it was that it is not their responsibility to learn what you have to teach them, your team, or for them to live up to your standard. It's your responsibility to guide them, right? Every time that I have uplifted and empowered my people, I have succeeded. And every single time that I have taken them for granted, thought they were lucky to be here because my name was mentioned alongside blah, 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 I failed. And I think this is a failure that becomes a part of the culture because we we prop up these ideals and we only think in the transactional nature of what value you can bring to that service. And look, there's strength in being able to live in the moment and being able to make sure that every single plate that goes up is quote unquote perfect. It also creates a ton of vulnerability. And, you know, you're only as good as your next plate up. Smile as part of your uniform, leave your shit at the door. We create this environment that is so, so self abusive and abusive to the team, yet we buy into it so deeply, and I bought into it so deeply. And for a short time, it does create 
the illusion of success. It really, really does. And you do hit those benchmarks of being able to have a successful restaurant. Yet what we've seen play out in the last 20 years, the, uh, the food network effect of we became caricatures of ourselves. It became about not the finding your people and being able to create something beautiful because we didn't want the nine to five. We didn't want the suit and tie, the cubicle. We wanted something different. We were those misfits or, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, the pirates on the pirate ship, as Bourdain called us. And so it created, again, this like false reality for ourselves. And I was all in. On that, And what I realize now and what chefs are going to have to realize now into the future is that we are stewards of something different. We are creating a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose for ourselves, for our business, for our community. And if we galvanize around those values, we have a real chance to to be something special, not just be able to say, Here's this cool shit I'm doing. Come buy my shit. And I did a lot of that. I think as an industry, we did a lot of that. And now chefs are going to be the vanguard at the forefront of building something new, something different, an industry that is equitable, profitable, sustainable for all people who are a part of it. Something that I call the whole house approach. We know this. We know that you know, we have to break down those those self-inflicted barriers of front of house versus back of house, AM versus PM, bartenders versus servers. We create these these false enemies within the team, one team, one mission that is there to try and accomplish the same goal. And that's what I want to see more of, that whole house approach. That's the opportunity that chefs and, and other leaders across the industry are going to be able to to put forth for us. And when I see things playing out like labor shortages, we don't have a labor issue. We have a culture issue playing out at mass scale. Restaurants are not a great place to work. And we're being called out on that. And we don't like it. And I understand because I am responsible for helping build the dynamic that is at play. The state of this industry is not the fault of a 22-year-old quote unquote, kids these days, they're the best chance we have to succeed if we listen and lead with some empathy, something I forgot a long time ago, and I'm fighting desperately to find again. And so when I think about that, I think about what experience are they having? And then I think back to my experience starting out when I was that misfit, when I didn't quite fit in, when I found that sense of belonging. And we need to give them that. And so I imagine, what do they look at when they see this industry, this business, this hierarchy, this toxic brigade system that, yes, is deadly effective, yet deadly to the sustainability of both people and businesses? Again, we see that playing out. So for me, I think about what happened to me and to us as an industry. Again, I kind of alluded to that food network effect. We went from being those misfits, hell, being the fucking help pretty much for so much of the existence of this restaurant industry to all of a sudden we were the cool kids. All of a sudden we were on TV. For me, I remember getting invited to, to... avalanche games by players on you know professional hockey players and after parties and all this stuff I was like who the fuck do I think I am I went to my head I thought that's that's what we were meant to be these you know micro celebrity chefs that that somehow gave me status and leverage it just gave me ego and that didn't help anything so we went from being the misfits to the cool kids to the establishment. And now kids these days are saying they don't want the cubicle, the nine to five, the suit and tie, except they're saying we don't want the overworked, underappreciated, undervalued that is this industry. I'm not going to work for for poverty wages in abusive environments to maybe someday be able to be what? 
the chef owner of a restaurant that has a 4% profit margin? Like, sign me up. Sounds awesome. And that's what we need to break through. That's this new whole house approach that we're going to take, that we create an environment for the guest internally and externally, that we create stories that go beyond the food, that include all the people that are behind the food. And we create this place that people on all sides feel seen and heard and valued and included in that narrative. And the leaders, the chefs that shift that narrative, they're going to have a real opportunity. And that's who I'm looking to support. That's what Best Served is all about. That's the people we want to have on our shows, the people we want to help with, with messaging and marketing, the types of individuals, teams, and businesses that we want to put on a pedestal. So again, our mission, we exist to amplify the worth and work of those who feed their community. And that's you, Chef. I appreciate your time. Cheers. Go to chefswithoutrestaurants.org to find our Facebook group, mailing list, and chef database. The community's free to join. You'll get gig opportunities, advice on building and growing your business, and you'll never miss an episode of our podcast. Have a great week.